You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. It's time to talk about the Green Bay Packers. This is your Packers Update, the Daily Cheese, brought to you by Packernet.com. The Daily Cheese is a collaboration with the Packernet Podcast, produced by the Pack Daddy, Ryan Schlipp, and I am your host, J.J. Leahy. You can follow me on Twitter, at J.J. Leahy, to stay up to date on all things Packers, or to submit questions. Hey, I really like talking about this little thing called Packers News, and holy smokes, there has not been any of it lately. Yee, it's been dry. But today, Brian Gutekunst took the stand and answered a bunch of questions. We got so much new information from the general manager, and I thought so many of the questions were really good ones. I'm going to just let you listen to almost the entirety of the press conference. I did cut out some of the slower parts and the couple of questions that were actually boring. Most of these were really good. And we can all get really excited together for the NFL Draft, which is this Thursday. Be prepared for the Packers to take a player you've never heard of, because that's what they usually do. Let's get right into it. Here is Packers General Manager Brian Gutekunst. Hey, Brian, will you or have you exercised the fifth-round option on Jair yet? We haven't, Rob, um, but I certainly would expect us to do so. What is your understanding of what Aaron wants, and what, if anything, has or will occur to satisfy that? Um, well, I'm, I'm not going to speak for, for Aaron, Rob. Um, what I will say is that um, um, you probably referred a little bit to the contract and some other things, but uh, that's kind of something we're working through. Um, you know, I think uh, it's, it's something that we've talked about quite a bit as we've worked through this salary cap situation, which is really kind of a two-year situation. Uh, we've looked at a lot of different things, and, and that's one of them. This isn't about the draft, and I know there's no steadfast deadline to get it done, but is it important to you and the front office to give him more than one more year of guaranteed money on his deal if if, if he wants that more long-term financial security? Yeah, Matt, I'll just say this. You know, First of all, I'm not going to get into contract specifics, but Aaron's our guy. Um, he's going to be our quarterback for the foreseeable future. We're excited about you know kind of the things we're going to try to accomplish here over the next couple of years. So um, we certainly think that um, – you know, with the contract that you're kind of talking about is something we'll work through. We're going to have to do probably a few things with different contracts as we, as we head towards the season and through the season to make sure that our salary cap situation, not only this year, uh, but in 2022 um, is square. So um, we're not done yet. We've done a lot to get here. Uh, We've kind of been doing things as we go and we will continue to do that as we go. Hey, Brian, I guess kind of picking off of of Aaron's our guy, if, if he is, your guy, why not push more guaranteed money onto next, you know, further years? Is it because of 2022 and, and what his cap hit would be? I mean, is that a deterrent to doing that? No, not not at all. Again, you know, um, we're going to be kind of in the same situation next year as we are this year, right? We're trying to continue to push more money out to, to field our team. I think we had to do a lot of things to bring guys back this year. Uh, and we'll have to do that again. So we're not done by any means yet. And we are working through that with a number of our players, including our. Jason Wilby. Hey, Goody. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Jason? I'll be honest with you. I'm tired. Um, <laughs> I'm tired of an off season where, and I know you guys are streaming this live, so I don't want to use any profanity, but <laughs> of people saying that the media are making stuff up. I lived through the summer of 2008, just like you did. So I'm not being disrespectful when I ask you this. We've known each other a long time. Um, I just kind of want some straight answers. Um, Where exactly do things stand, not contract-wise, but just in general, between you and this team and your future Hall of Fame quarterback? Is there a disconnect? Is there unhappiness on either side? Because there has certainly been some intimations of that from some, and I don't think that those people are making it up. So I just want to know where you feel things stand with Aaron and you and with the organization. Yeah, listen, this, I, I, I think I understand your question. Uh, I'm not really sure exactly where you're coming from. But what I will say is, like, you know, we're really excited about Aaron Rodgers and his future with the Green Bay Packers. We think, you know, he's going to be our quarterback for the foreseeable future. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, obviously – 
every year there's different things you go through to kind of get to the season. And I think we're going through those right now, whether it be contractually, whether it be, you know, working with our players on other things. And, and that's where we are. But uh, again, uh, he's such a unique, um, different player than, than anyone that I've ever been around. And he affects our organization in so many different ways that, uh, um, you know, you just can't, you can't uh, value him because he's so, he's so important to what we do. So we're excited moving forward and um, we'll kind of see where things go. Can I follow up real quick on that so I can clarify then? Sure. I, I guess what I don't understand is the guy's cap number is 37.5 million. I'm not Russ, so I don't understand the cap the way you and him do. What's the upside of having a guy that you could restructure his contract right now counting that much against your cap? What's the upside of that? I'll say this, Jason. Like, you know, we – and I think you know me well enough to know that I don't really get into too many details about conversations with players, contract negotiations with players. Um, but again, like I said earlier, I think it's very important for us to, to work through the next two years to get this salary cap thing right. Um, we will have to address many contracts uh, over the next four or five months to, to kind of get under the cap for the season. And that's certainly one where we will probably address that as well. Talking about uh, this two-year deal that you're working through with the salary cap, how much of that has driven your decision-making when it comes to the fact, notwithstanding what I'm sure will be a very exciting long snapper <laughs> battle this training camp, but you have really eschewed bringing in guys from other programs to create competition within your franchise? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously every year is unique, Aaron, as you know. I think, you know, this year, the way I look at it is we were able to kind of sign the, the number one running back on the market the number one left tackle on the market, the number one defensive tackle on the market. Um, so we just happened to all play for us, which is great. Uh, kudos to Ted Thompson there. But uh, uh, I thought we were very active. We certainly did a lot, um, maybe a little bit outside of what we normally do as far as pushing money forward to kind of continue to keep this team uh, together so we can, uh, you know, make another run. Hi, Brian. I know there's some protocols around who can be in, in the room this year with you. Um, I'm, I'm curious, where are you going to be located and who is going to be with you in the room? Gotcha. Yeah, we'll be back in the draft room. Uh, obviously, last year we weren't able to do that, so it'll be nice to be back in the draft room. The way the league set it up, there was a couple choices that you, you could have to, um, to do it and follow the protocol. So we'll have about 18 guys in the room. Uh, we really don't have to exclude anybody. That's about the normal number of people we have in the room. Um, so, um, you know, along with um, our scouts and, you know, obviously coach and um, Russ and um, there'll be a number of medical people in the room as well. Um, so we'll have our normal allotment and uh, there'll be some protocols in place, uh, but we're lucky enough here to have a, you know, really large draft room. Uh, so we're able to spread out and um, kind of follow those protocols. Hey, Brian, um, you know, I've talked to a couple of guys um, you know, with, with, with players able to opt back in for 2021. And one guy said that the draft class falls off a cliff in the fifth round. Another guy said one through 259, it's fine. I guess, A, what do you think is of the class overall? And will you be able to actually fill a whole draft board? Yeah, um, we have. And I think it's a pretty good draft overall. I will say to your point, Bill, that uh, certainly like, you know, on the different uh, areas of um, our room in the draft room where we keep different names, there's, there's just less. Specifically, I think it's going to affect us a little bit in the undrafted free agent market. There's just a, a smaller pool of players maybe than there, there have been in the past. Um, it'll be interesting to going into next year to see how that, that changes next year's draft and if that's significantly larger or, or what. We'll kind of see how that goes. But we kind of anticipated this a little bit and kind of um, I think our roster sits you know just above 70 right now, which is a, it's much higher than we've ever been before. So. Um, I think as we go into this, we'll be a little more selective, uh, certainly in the undrafted free agent market. Regarding that, thanks for doing this. I'm just wondering regarding that notion about that there's the overall draft class maybe not being what it's been in previous years in terms of the depth. How might that impact the trade markets, particularly the second and third days of the draft? Do you, will there be more teams maybe trying to trade to get add picks late in future draft years, do you think? Or? Yeah, I could see that. That's not always the easiest thing to do. And there's there's not a ton of those kind of day three trades for for future picks. Um, but I could see some some people trying to acquire, you know, 2021. Uh, I'm sorry, 2022 picks um, just because they feel like maybe their board isn't as strong. But I don't think that'll be us. I think our the way we look right now with the numbers, um, we kind of feel that our board is is significantly strong, um, you know, basically at the top 
uh, as well through through the bottom. So we feel pretty good about it. In such a weird year, especially with this draft not being able to see them to the combine, what position do you see as being the deepest in this year's draft? That's a good question. I don't know if I see one particular, uh, deep, you know, that's the deepest. You know, I thought there was, you know, pretty good uh, depth at the offensive line group. Um, you know, I thought there's some good players in the secondary. I like that, that depth there. But uh, I didn't think there was one overwhelmingly deep position like some years there have been. Hey, Brian, with the new defensive coordinator and Joe Barry in your corner, how much do you involve him in the process to ensure his vision aligns with what you and your scouts are doing and trying to find an ideal fit with the team? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's those, those things are vitally important in those conversations, especially between Matt and I, um, happen a lot as we go through this process. Um, you know, we have, we, I think we've always strived here to try to try to acquire as many versatile players that could fit any system because things do change and everything is so multiple now that you have to have guys that can do a lot of things specifically with injuries and, and stuff. I think if you get too scheme specific, uh, you can get in a bad spot as the season wears along. So, um, but I do think those conversations are very important. And, um, again, I'm excited about Joe and what he's going to bring to the table and, uh, I think he likes our group, and um, we'll, we'll certainly try to add to it this weekend. Hey, Brian, this kind of goes along with what Nags was asking a little while ago. Um, you guys have had a pretty well-established history of not drafting shorter guys. I'm just kind of wondering why that is. Um, there, you know, there's obviously been quite a few receivers or corners who've, who've made it at you know that five nine-ish range. Yeah, I think it's because Ron and Ted pounded into door all of our brains <laughs> were being trained that, that that wasn't allowed. No, and also just, I think. Um, I do think that like you have to kind of decide kind of what football team and how you want to look and, and how you want to be. And I think up here in, in Green Bay and our weather conditions and stuff that we've always tended to lean around bigger, uh, more physical uh, players. Um, you know, if you're playing in a dome or down south, those guys that are smaller, quicker with speed. Uh, I think that lasts during the season a little bit longer than if you're up here. Um, and the durability factors. So I think that's part of it. Um, I know that all of us that were trained under Ron and Ted, you know, it's a, it's a, that's a hard thing to get over, but I do think if the right player is there, um, you know, Jair was very, very close to our Mendoza line, which sometimes drops a little bit, depending on how good of a player you are. Um, so we, we certainly will consider those players, but I do think that, uh, um, which is kind of part of the way we're all trained. How much of a wild card is your draft class from last year? You got a taste of a few of the guys, just a little bit. And when you were doing your offseason assessments, um, how does how do they play into that? And how do you think that might affect your draft this year? Yeah, I thought the guys last year that had opportunities last year really um, did well in what, in what was presented to them. I think the interesting thing, you know, we've been very healthy the last two years that haven't we haven't had to really press a lot of the younger guys into duty. So, but when they did, whether it was, you know, Johnny Runyon early on and through the year, or whether it was DeGuara right at the start of the season before he got injured, uh, certainly AJ Dillon, when he got his opportunity to, to shine, he did so. Um, but, you know, there, Vernon Scott, I mean, there, there's a bunch of guys, even some undrafted guys, Henry Black did some really, really good things and Chris Barnes. So, yeah, no, I think, you know, um, we've talked a lot about here about the progression that uh, it takes to become a um, an NFL player and that, that jump between year two, you know, one and two and year two and three is is really important. I think the thing that I like best about last year's class is really the people. I mean, they are workers, uh, they're humble, unselfish teammates. And uh, I, I think, you know, all those guys got pretty bright futures. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. (laughs) 
Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal, independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Um, so there's been a lot of talk already about your cap situation here this year and next year. We know drafts are as much about the future as they are about the present, but maybe is this one more so given the situation you're in with all these contracts coming up that are big, big money that you need a lot of players that are cost control for a while that can contribute. So I guess if we look at this 2021 draft through the lens of 2022, would that be fair? Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously, you know, you guys know around here how important the draft is to our process and and what it means. We certainly believe in the draft and develop and um, and and you know developing players to to become you know future stars here. So um, it's very very important. I think uh, this year is probably not a lot different than any other. I think the situation we find ourselves in maybe differently than we have in the past here is just that we've we've kind of really pushed out some money into future years because we realize. Uh, the opportunity that is before us, you know what I mean? Um, you know, we're a really good football team. Uh, we've been knocking on the door for two years and we'd like to, we'd like to, to finish that. You know, the lack of the, the combine with the medicals, there just seems to be a whole lot of guys with medical questions coming into this draft. How apprehensive does that make you? Yeah, it's tough. I will say, you know, we have an excellent medical staff with Flea and Dr. McKenzie who, who put a lot of time in, to these prospects. They've been probably challenged more this year than any other, just because of uh, us not having a traditional combine. Um, but I have a lot of faith in those guys. And I think, uh, you know, every year there's, um, there's risk with all these guys, you know, medically, and, and uh, it's a little bit of a, um, you know, kind of an educated guess more than anything, but I, I have a lot of confidence in those guys and the information they provide me with to make those decisions. Um, but you, you always have a little, apprehension and this year i think specifically with some guys maybe on that third day um you're gonna have less information than you've had in the past uh brian you have 10 picks and you mentioned how close you guys have been to the super bowl the last couple of years how tempting is it at some point to go up and get a guy maybe a little more talented a little more athletic whatever with those picks or to trade up this year yeah. um it's always tempting for me i think uh when you're sitting at 29 and watching those kind of players come off the board that you're, you know, that you've spent so much time studying and, and, and kind of thinking about how they could affect your football team. It's always tempting. I think it's uh, you got to be careful and uh, you got to be careful not to fall in love with any individual player, but um, we'll look at each opportunity we have to move up. We've done that in the past. Uh, we've moved down in the past as well, but we'll look at each opportunity. And if it makes sense, um, we, we certainly won't be afraid to do that. With how little you've been able to add in free agency, does that uh, does that alter the way that you look at it, and, and maybe be a little bit more likely to, to target a need to with where your situation is as a team right now, or is it just like any other year? I think it's um, you know maybe slightly alters it, Ryan. I do again. I'll go back to we. I think we kind of did you know add a lot to our football team in free agency with the, the guys we resigned, but um, I do think it probably alters it slightly. Um, and maybe gives a little bit more weight to the guys that could, could help us in the right now. But that's a little bit of a risky, you know, game because you, you really don't know, you know, until you get them here, until you get them in your system and, and you see how they adapt to what Matt and, and the coaches are trying to do with them. You really, you really don't know. So, um, again, um, it has an impact, but I think it's pretty slight. Hey, Brian. Um You've talked a number of times over the years about how everything you guys do in personnel is rooted in what, uh, Ron brought to Green Bay all those years ago. There's clear positions where you guys have obviously some kind of system that works, whether it's second and third round wide receivers, whether it's 
you know, your fourth, fifth, sixth round lineman. There's lots of hits there. There are other positions where there are not so many hits. Do you go back ever, like in the off season, say when you're talking to your scouts and maybe having these draft meetings where you refine that process and kind of retool what it is you're looking at threshold wise, athletic testing wise to maybe try and up that hit rate? Yeah, absolutely. All the time we self scout, you know, we'd like to take, you know, usually that, that month of May and June and, and really spend some time, uh, not just on the previous year, but, um, we'll go back, you know, three, 10, 15 years at times in drafts and just kind of look at a lot of different things. Not only, um, how us as the Green Bay Packers have operated and, and how our boards have held up, you know, against time, but then also just the trends in the national football league, uh, the game does change a little bit. Um, there's part, part of it, you know, the, the blocking, the tackling, the physicality of it, that always stays the same. But I do think the game does change, and uh, you're always looking to see if um, how that affects uh, our organization and our football team. Um, also, just you know where we play and, and and the weather that we play outdoors and the comfort, you know, the division we play in, and there's just you, you look at a lot of different things, and um, you take all that into account, and you know, just try to get better. Brian, just because we haven't talked to you in a while, can you explain how you guys came to the? Well, not the specifics, obviously, but why you guys wanted to bring Kevin King back and, and what you think he can give you guys still if he stays healthy. Yeah, I think as you know, I think I talked a little bit about it the last time I talked, but I think that certainly as we finished the, uh, you know, 2020 season heading into this offseason, that wasn't something that I thought um, was going to be a great possibility uh, to bring Kevin back. But as kind of the pandemic affected the, the market a little bit, um, I think we were able to. Um, you know, to get him back and I was super pleased with it. I mean, he, uh, obviously Kevin's had his ups and downs with his injury history here, but, um, he's played a lot of good ball for us and we're better, we're better with him on the field, um, than we would be without him. Brian, I realize shadow boxing with Aaron Rodgers is not totally indicative of somebody's health status, but, uh, what's your understanding of where Dave is right now and what kind of impact does his injury have on this weekend? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I haven't seen Dave in, in probably about you know three weeks to a month, but I know all the, all the reports are fantastic. I know when he left here, he was way ahead of schedule. And we're certainly, you know, we have a lot of confidence in David and the way he takes care of his body, the way he works, how important it is to him, what a professional he is, um, that he's going to, you know, he's going to be on on target with all that stuff. At the same time, he's such an important part of our, our football team um, that we will be, you know, that's a very important part of what we're trying to do. So I don't think it'll impact this particular draft, um, but um, he's obviously an impactful person. So not having him out there will um, certainly, you know, isn't good for us. So we're going to, we're going to make sure we do the right thing as we go through his rehab and protect him a little bit from himself. Cause he's a grinder and he's going to push himself as hard as he can to, to get back. Um, but everything that I've heard is positive. Real quick. Would you be shocked if he were ready to play in the opener? Nothing would shock me with him. He's a, he's a unique individual. Um, he's different than most just with how he attacks things, his mentality. And so nothing, nothing would shock me with David. Hey, Goody, you know, when we used to do these with Ted, they were kind of a fun cat and mouse game trying to get him to say something of significance. But one of my favorites was, I don't know if it was 06 or 07, but I asked him about how need factored in. And he like stepped away from the podium and he went to the back of the wall and like was trying to explain how what's on the left side and what goes over the top and rounds and positions. And it wasn't great for people doing broadcast media, but it was really informative. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, and he was explaining that need was kind of a tiebreaker for him, that right. if he had two guys that were graded the same, that that would break the tie. How has need kind of evolved in how you view it? And then, You've also been really aggressive and not afraid to go up. And other guys, including Ted, used to say, you got to let the board come to you. So how has that philosophy developed too? Yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, Ted's right. I think need really does play a bigger part when it's you kind of have equal valued players and, and you're trying to decide. Um, but at the same time, um, I don't know if it's necessarily evolved, but I think it's the state of your football team. And what you feel you have, I mean, there are times, um, and I don't know if, if I've really been in that situation very often, but there are times where you feel like to play a game that week or, you know, coming up, you, 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 didn't, you don't feel like you could do it because you, you're missing a certain piece. Um, I think we're fortunate that, that we don't feel that way right now. We feel we could go play. We have um, a very good football team coming back, um, which gives us me a little more freedom, I think, as we, as we attack the board to, to go with the best player. Um, 
But um, I think at the same time, I think, you know, for me, you know, the, the one thing that the, if we have a chance to move up to take a, a specific player that we feel is, is special, uh, I think you have to always, you know, consider that. And I think we have since, since I've been, you know, kind of the last three years, I think we've done that. And we will always kind of do that. There's just, there's only so many game changing type players in this league. And if you have the opportunity to acquire one, I think you have to consider it. Hey, Brian, it's been three years now since your first tra- draft as general manager. Any part of that process, that first class from you know the very early stages of scouting to the actual night of the draft, what have you learned or changed in your approach since then? I think I'd like to think we've constantly evolved and, and um, technology has become a little bit more part of it. Um, and uh, we've, I think there's a, um, just a confidence I think you take from going, you know, multiple drafts and, and understanding how it's going to play out. And until you kind of sit in that chair the first time, it's even though I had been in draft rooms, you know, dozens of times, it's, 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 it's different when you know, the, the entire room's looking at you to make the decision. So I think there's a comfort level after you've done it a few years and uh, moving up and down the board and, and making trades where you just, uh, it just puts you at ease. So I think that's part of it. I think our group as a whole, um, has kind of, you know, just, we've all been together for a while now. And I think that experience really pays off. All right. I can sit. Thank you. Thank you guys. I guess how difficult is it to know what maybe you're really getting in a player who opted out of the entire 2020 season and hasn't played a game since 2019? How do you look at that? Yeah, I think it's, it's, um, it's a case by case, Mike. I think each individual that opted out of the 2020 season, I think we spent a lot of time this this uh, spring on why, or what the reasonings were for them, and um, really, it's um, it's interesting. Obviously, the different conferences and the way they handled the the, um, the pandemic and how they approach their seasons uh, is an important factor. I think the West Coast and the Big Ten maybe have, you know canceled their seasons at one point, and a lot of players made decisions at that point. Uh, that were pretty tough to come back from uh, once they decided to have a season where the SEC and the ACC, um, you know, I think they never got to that point where they canceled their season. So um, some some guys had, you know, family uh, matters and people who had um, significant health risks. And so we go we go through each individual and, and kind of figure out why they opted out. Um, and um, but then there's guys that you know played half the season and opted out at the end because they've got advice from their coaches and uh, there's just a ton of different reasons. So we go through those each one and um, the way we look at it kind of uh, depends on that.